Yeah. Well, hello. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. I would say if you would like to just uh, move up a little bit, we're a nice, small, intimate group, which means we get to have a really good and fun discussion. So don't, don't sit at the back. Move up. So thanks for joining us. I'm Roger Mark D'Souza, the Director of uh, Population, Environmental Change, and Security here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. And this is my second Monday on the job. So I've been here second Tuesday. <laughs> Um, but have worked with the center for, for quite a while, so um, I'm delighted to be here and, and glad that you were able to join us. And I'm excited um, for the session that we have today, Facing the Future, Empowering Youth to Protect Their Health and the Environment. And um, I know Joanne Castro, Dr. Castro, fairly well. We were actually in the Philippines um, two, two or three months ago and we were meeting with some of the local decision makers that were working on integrating population, health, and environment. And we met with the members of uh, the local governance, governing council, um, or the local governance unit, the LGU, in, the, in, in this one area in the Philippines. And uh, we were trying to find out why they had recently passed a PHE, a Population Health and Environment Ordinance and what were some of the motivating factors behind it. And one of the, the, the council members said to us, you know, you NGOs come and go, but this PHE idea is really a key concept that's important to us, our well-being, and the well-being of our families. That's why we have passed an ordinance, and that's why we continue to work on these issues. And what I like about that, it, it reminds me about why we're here today, very much at the Woodrow Wilson Center, we focus on how can we work on independent research, how can we have a good, open, and meaningful dialogue around issues, and how can we move to actionable ideas, like the idea that we heard um, that Joanne's work has built upon, and that we heard this, this um, LGU member in the Philippines say, we like it, we're going to take action, let's move on it. So as, as many of you know, who have attended sessions here at the Woodrow Wilson Center, it's a formal memorial to our 20th president, the only president thus far to have achieved a PhD. And what I like about what we do is we bring together people, not only who have an academic PhD, but who have a PhD in life. And they share those experiences. So this is a little bit of what we'll be looking at today. Um, we're here under the Environmental Change and Security Program, which is 19 years old, and that looks at various connections between health environment, livelihoods, population, and security. And the event is part of our HELPS project, which many of you know stands for Health, Environment, Livelihoods, Population, and Security with generous support. It's a five-year effort that's funded by USAID's Office of Population and Reproductive Health. So with, with that, that introduction, we're quite excited to have um, two speakers today that will be looking at how we engage youth. Um, and I was chatting with Leslie a little bit um, prior to, to the session today. She is from Alaska, but hasn't been there for a few years has been in, in Ghana for two years, has three more, year, three more months of her, her Peace Corps um, stint in Ghana and will be coming back and will be looking for jobs. So <laughs> once you hear what she has to say, um, be, be thinking of that because she may be coming back to you for ideas. So we'll start with Leslie and then we'll um, then go on to, to Joanne. Um, so Leslie? Thank you. Got to get my direction right on this. So uh, yes, my name is Leslie Mwinya, and I am a Peace Corps volunteer in Ghana. I have spent the majority of my time working on various health-related project, projects, but most of my time has been spent on the Population Health Environment Project, which uh, I will be speaking about today. As a volunteer, I was partnered with the Integrated Coastal Fisheries Governance Initiative. And 
it was a bit of a long name, and so they came up with a nickname called Hen Puano, which in the local language means our coast. The project is implemented through a USAID cooperative agreement with the Coastal Resources Center of the University of Rhode Island. And the implementing partners of the initiative include the World Fish Center, Sustainometrics, Friends of the Nation, and the Department of Fisheries. Henquano seeks to support the government of Ghana as it works towards reducing poverty, addressing food security issues, developing a fisheries management program, and increasing biodiversity conservation. And they are also working towards addressing the major threats found along the coast of Ghana. One of those threats is the overexploitation of the fisheries. Uh, many of the current fishing practices are damaging to the environment. Uh, in order to bring in a large catch, fishermen use uh, daily fishing with um, chemicals, lights, dynamite, and undersized nets. All of these are illegal in Ghana, but there is a lack of law enforcement, and so fishermen can just continue those practices without any consequence. There are many activities along the coast that cause the degradation of coastal habitats and accelerate shoreline erosion. Collecting large amounts of sand called sand winning is really common. And this increases the rate of erosion and leaves many communities vulnerable to flooding. Cutting mangroves is also frequently seen. And this is particularly harmful because mangrove stands provide an essential breeding ground for many aquatic species. Another threat is the rapid coastal development. Houses are built really close together, and proper refuse and waste disposal are not managed, and there's an overall lack of sanitation, and all of these things contribute to the rapid spread of disease. And in certain locations, communities are beginning to encroach on wetlands and other natural habitats. So the Hen Puano project works entirely in the western region of Ghana, as you can see here. Um, so these are, these are the six coastal districts that we work in. And um, the PHE work is primarily happening in the Elambella district here along the coast. And that's where I live. Uh, when, a, when a PHE component was first introduced to the Hen Puano project, it was hoped that by incorporating family planning and health interventions, it would generate benefits that would serve as incentives for communities to adopt and sustain good fisheries and conservation practices. And so with that goal, the following PHE objectives were developed. First, to increase awareness in PHE, family planning, reproductive health, child nutrition, and fisheries management, and their role in health, food security, poverty alleviation, and coastal conservation in Hen Puano target communities. Second, to increase access and use of family planning methods and services. Third, to increase knowledge and support of local leaders in incorporating PHE activities into their existing agenda <coughs> activities and plans. So these objectives has, have helped to shape and guide the interventions that have been implemented throughout the Western region in Ghana. And while PHE projects are ongoing throughout the Western region, uh, today we'll be focusing on those interventions involving youth, and those have been located primarily in the Elambella district that I showed on the map. So to give a brief overview of the Elambella district, it was chosen as one of the areas for PHE uh, because it was thought to offer some of the best opportunities 
for PHE work. It's the home of the greater Amanzuli wetlands, which are said to be the most biologically rich wetlands in Ghana. Also, the Alambella District hosts the only community health nurses training institution within the Western region. And so um, there will be some discrepancies in these statistics, but it, we do see that the district has been demonstrating higher than average teenage pregnancy rates uh, with the district rate at 14% compared to the national rate at 7%. And we see even greater percentages along the coast with a range from 11% to 30%. Uh, family planning acceptor rates also, also show similar differences. Uh, the district recorded a 19% family planning acceptor rate uh, and along the coast, zero to 34%. And with the national record, uh, the na nation recorded an acceptor rate of 31%. So there's a big difference between the district along the coast and the national rates. Because of these features, the Alambella District was chosen as one of the pilot areas for PHE work, and more, sp more specifically, PHE work involving the youth. The following PHE youth interventions are taking place right now in the Alambella District. And I'll be talking in much greater detail about all of these interventions. Student nurses at the Esiama Community Health Nurses Training School are being trained as youth peer educators and school staff are being trained in PHE implementation. A PHE student association at the Nurses Training School has been organized and an adolescent sexual and reproductive health course is taught each year at the Nurses Training School. In addition to the interventions at the Nurses Training School, we've also moved into some of the junior and senior high schools as well. Uh, selected staff in junior high schools have been trained as PHE club advisors, and also in the senior high schools, selected staff have been trained as uh, youth peer educator trainers. And subsequently, PHE clubs have been organized in those selected senior and junior high schools in collaboration with the Ghana School Health Education Program, also known as SHEP. So we're gonna now look at all of these interventions with a little bit more detail. The Esiama Community Health Nurses Training School is, uh, has been working closely with the Hen Puano Project uh, for the past two plus years. This school graduates approximately 300 community health nurses annually. Throughout their coursework, the students are required to complete three internships and they participate in weekly field practicums uh, during the final two semesters. Uh, their internships and practicums include home visiting, child welfare clinics, and antenatal clinics. Once students complete the program, then the majority of them are posted within the Western region to work as uh, community health nurses. During initial meetings between the nurses school and the Hen Puano team, the principal of the school was really interested in collaboration on PHE activities and she said that students themselves needed education on adolescent sexual and reproductive health, as well as on population and environment issues. And then she suggested that students could then act, act as a conduit for disseminating uh, PHE messages to young people in coastal communities throughout the district. So because of the school's immediate need for an instructor, they were a little short on staff, um, I began to teach the adolescent sexual and reproductive health class. This course had formerly been included in the family planning class, and it had very little emphasis placed on it. It was really an afterthought 
and maybe they talked about it for a week out of the entire semester. Uh, but now it is its own semester-long class. And in the last two years, we've had over 600 students complete the class. This course has increased the students' awareness of adolescent development and behavior and it has also uh, improved their communication and counseling techniques for adolescent clients. They've learned that uh, oftentimes you don't counsel it, an adolescent the same way as you would an adult. And it has also reduced students' misconceptions and stigma associated with adolescent sexuality and contraceptive use. It's interesting in Ghana and most likely other parts of the world that they understand that there's a problem with teenage pregnancy and sexual activity, and yet they have a negative idea of adolescents using contraceptives. So we've been working to reduce that stigma and those misconceptions. So once the adolescent sexual and reproductive health class was underway, we started to train students as PHE youth peer educators using the balanced PHE youth peer educator manual. The sessions were held after school hours and the students voluntarily completed the course. And so far we've had over 300 student nurses complete the youth peer educator training voluntarily. Later, a P we organized a PHE orientation workshop for faculty, and we had uh, 25 faculty members participate in that, and that really helped to promote the staff involvement at the school. And not long after that, we organized the student association, PHE student association, and the principal and one other faculty member act as advisors for the association. And this association has been going on for about a year and a half, and we've had more than 80 students uh, be active members of that student association. The PHE Student Association is involved in several activities. Uh, one of these is that every Saturday morning, the members of the association go out and visit the coastal communities. There are 18 fishing villages in the Ellenbella district and we try to visit each community once a month. We accomplish this by dividing the association members into smaller groups and each group goes out and visits a community. We usually are able to visit four or five communities each Saturday. During our Saturday community visits, the members of the student association look specifically for youth to speak with. And they usually begin their discussion by sharing a story found in the balanced youth peer educator manual called Too Many Mouths to Feed. And this story brings out many issues pertaining to resource management, family planning, and food security. And then they continue on and share additional messages about population pressures on the resources, environmental sanitation, adolescent reproductive health, teenage pregnancy prevention, and also informing them about where they can access family planning methods. We also have uh, some IEC materials that we use with permission from the Johns Hopkins Behavior Change Support Project and students are free to hand out those materials to community members. Uh, members of the association also try to do PHE education during their weekly school practicum visits and during their internships. And so very slowly and gradually, the PHE messages are be being spread throughout all of Ghana, not just along the coast in these 18 communities. Since the start of the student association, communities have received multiple visits and over 1,200 individuals 
have been able to receive a PHE message uh, with youth comprising more than half of the individuals reached. In some of the communities that we visit, there have been some school-based PHE clubs organized. And when we visit communities that have a school PHE club, then the members of the two groups team up and they do the community education together. And so this is really beneficial for both groups. The student nurses are provided with very knowledgeable guides to the communities to show them around and uh, tell them who to go and speak to. And then the local school PHE club members receive positive mentoring and motivation from the student nurses. So the, that, those are basically the interventions that we have going at the nurses training school. Uh, but we also have interventions happening outside of that area as well. Uh, by policy of the Ghana Education Service, all schools should have a school health education program, also known as SHEP. Unfortunately, we've seen that most schools do not have a functioning SHEP program. So the Hen Puano PHE team saw this as a great opportunity to help schools in developing a functioning SHEP program as well as a way to bring PHE education to more youth. Recently, uh, a few months ago, we organized a workshop in collaboration with the Ghana Education Service and the Ghana Health Service. And both of these organizations are responsible in part for this school health program. However, neither of them have been active in facilitating the success of the program. So the participants of this workshop uh, were given an overview of PHE, and then were given an overview of the SHEP program, and many of them were not familiar at all with the SHEP program, uh, even though it, it's a requirement by the Ghana Education Service. Uh, so we tried to let them know what it is. And then we showed them how they could bring the two programs together. Um, so all the participating schools that we had invited agreed to start a PHE club, and the participating nurses agreed to act as a club resource person. At the end of the workshop, schools were presented with a PHE club toolkit, and it was made up of a few educational supplies and also a lesson manual, so that it would be very easy for the teachers to uh, teach about PHE and also about the school health program. So some topics in the lesson manual included personal health, reproductive health, environmental sanitation, food security, and resource management. management. And we made sure that everything was, uh, of course, age appropriate for both the junior high schools and the senior high schools. We also strongly encourage the club, the club advisors to organize either school-wide or community-wide activities in conjunction with uh, different world celebration days, like Earth Day or World Environment Day, Malaria Day, and World AIDS Day. At our workshop, we had uh, 31 teachers, both junior and senior high school teachers, seven community health nurses and seven local leaders with representatives from the Ghana Education Service and the Ghana Health Service. Following the workshop, the Hen Puano team made follow-up visits to all of the participating schools to make sure that the organization of the clubs were, were happening. Uh, so, so far, we've had PHE clubs organized in four senior high schools, and these club members are first trained in PHE, HIV, and environment issues, and then they're able to take those messages to fellow classmates as well to, uh, as well to other schools. 
And in the four participating senior high schools, we have about 150 members of those clubs. And students will begin more peer education activities in May. So like in the senior high schools, uh, we also have organized PHE clubs in junior high schools. And again, they receive education in PHE and other health and environment topics. And then they share those messages with their classmates and nearby primary schools. We have 26 junior high schools that are participate, participating in the program, which combined have approximately 520 club members. And more of their activities will also start in May. But recently in one community, uh, a sports week was organized. And there were 14 junior high schools and primary schools invited to participate. And so the PHE clubs saw this as a great opportunity to do a PHE activity. And so they organized some little stations for the participating schools to move around and uh, learn about PHE, HIV, nutrition, malaria prevention, and positive environmental sanitation practices. And it was a lot of fun, and you could just see the excitement of the, the students learning about all of these topics. Um, so with any project, uh, the Hen Puano PHE work in Ellumbella has had its own implementation challenges. Uh, it was a struggle to get activities going. Part of the problem here, part of the issue was that I live really far away from the main Coastal Resources Center office. And so um, it took a long time for budgets to be reviewed and then revised and reviewed again. Uh, but through frequent communication and follow-up, we were able to get these PHE activities off the ground. And from the start, we actually underestimated the cost of transportation. Uh, the, nurses, the nursing students go out into the field, and so, you know, we have to cover the cost of transportation. And um, we've had to increase that budget several times. And the cost of, of fuel continues to increase in Ghana. And so, again, our budget continues to increase as well. We have also had some challenges in the lack of access to family planning commodities. The student nurses are not yet qualified to distribute commodities. And so during our field visits, they are just only providing education, but they're not able to provide any family planning commodities. And many people live a really good distance from a health clinic. The Ghana uh, Health Service is aware of this problem, that there's a lack of access. And so there are some plans in place for a community-based distribution system for uh, getting family planning methods out there. In the past two years, we have learned uh, many valuable lessons about working with communities and partners and youth. Uh, we have needed to develop a lot of flexibility and also willingness to change our plans and projects when necessary. Uh, frequent communication again and follow-up has really been helpful in making sure that activities are uh, accomplished according to schedule as much as possible. Partnerships with local NGOs and also with the local government has really enabled the PHE activities to be successful. Uh, when we were developing the PHE Student Association at the Nurses Training School, we encountered challenges with the cost of transportation. And so we were able to reach an agreement with the training school that Hen Puano would cover the cost of fuel and the school would provide their school bus and driver uh, for the activities, for the field activities. And this has really worked out well in the past year and a half. 
And so also our partnership with the Ghana Health Service and Ghana Education Service has enabled us to bring the PHE clubs into the senior and junior high schools. We could have seen greater achievements in the communities if uh, more emphasis had been placed on working with and educating the community leaders on PHE issues. This could have led to more community mobilization and action in the long run had uh, the leaders of the communities, the traditional leaders, been more involved in the, in the project. We've also learned a great deal about the need to promote volunteerism. We have struggled to involve adults and community leaders who truly understand and are committed to volunteering. But on the other hand, we have found great success in finding youth who are willing to volunteer. In our PHE program in the Ellen Bella District, we have seen that sustainability and the continuation of the project will come from the youth who are involved. These youth are so highly motivated and they work diligently in their responsibilities as peer educators. Much of their motivation and dedication comes from the respect that they earn from peers and community leaders. And so by working as peer educators, they acquire and demonstrate leadership skills which enable them to be regularly involved in community decision making. Uh, we've also seen that by providing workshops for school staff, we've been able to increase the staff support and participation. Uh, communities have continued to express their appreciation for the PHE project. It has really been a vehicle for outreach programs at the community level. It has opened the door for communication about illegal fishing, sand winning, reproductive health, and environmental sanitation. Partnerships have developed successfully with the Ghana Education Service, the Ghana Health Service, the Nurses Training School, and local government and traditional leaders, and those par partnerships have enabled the PHE activities to run successfully. And youth have definitely been our greatest allies in this project, and they have pl pl played a profound role in the success of the PHE Henpuano project. And these youth will definitely ensure the project's continuation in this region. I have been amazed and inspired by the youth that I've worked with, with their dedication and motivation to help their countrymen and to try and make their communities better places. So, thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Leslie. It's, it's, there were a number of things that you mentioned that I thought were really interesting. I like sort of the formal and informal ways that you were engaging the youth. It was good to see some of the behavior change communications, outcomes, and results coming out of it. Um, also very good to see, you know, very often with the youth programs, you hear that you have to take these programs where the youth are. So um, really good to see that you sort of incorporating sports, the sports week, where there's a fun element, you know, that, that that's where you can engage the youth. And very practical problems and very practical solutions and lessons learned. And, and good to see for a Peace Corps volunteer can come out of this experience amazed and inspired by this change that you're able to, to accomplish in a relatively short period of time. And, and really excited to hear that, that you were able to use some of the tools and materials that have been developed by uh, PhD projects like the Balance Project, and to thank Linda and the Balance Project for also being able to bring you here to work with us. So, so thank you, and that's, that's really excellent and exciting um, um, results. So sort of building on the Balance Project, we want to um, introduce our second speaker, Joanne Castro, who is a, a long-time P 
PhD advocate and, and champion. She is currently the executive vice president of PATH Foundation Philippines and serves as the PhD technical assistance lead of the Balanced Project supported by USAID. So I, Joanne, I saw you nodding while Leslie was talking about her work in Ghana. So it would be interesting to see some of the comparisons with your work and Leslie's work. So I give it over to you. Thank you, Roger Mark, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the Wilson Center for organizing this. Um, and on behalf of the Balance Project and the uh, Ashmore Foundation, who also supports the youth component of the PHE project that we do in the Philippines, um, and also on behalf of the youth. Um, I'm not a youth anymore. Uh, I've been a youth once, but it's <laughs> actually a pleasure and an honor to be able to share uh, the successes and the lessons learned in uh, doing PHE with the youth. Let me introduce first um, the organization where I come from. Um, it's Path Foundation Philippines. It's called PFPI. It's a non stock nonprofit organization. It's registered in the Philippines with the Securities and Exchange Commission. We're actually 20 years old now. We also have a 501c3 status, um, which was uh, in effect since 2002. And as an organization, we provide technical assistance and we also execute and implement our own programs um, um, in, our, in our project sites. Let me uh, bring you to the map, which are actually the project sites of the balance uh, of PFPI. Um, you will notice that most, this, these are areas that are um, that are highlighted in blue are areas that have been identified by the government of the Philippines and Conservation International as the marine priority for conservation. So the ones that are darkly colored, uh, dark blue colored, there are eight of them in these areas. These are biodiversity areas that are either very high or high priority for conservation. The Balance Project and Ashmore Foundation, which implements the Empower Project, uh, which is a component for the youth, is in four out of eight key marine biodiversity areas. So if you look at the Philippines, uh, we are in the Visayas area and some in the Verde Island Passage. So we are 68. Um, there are 68 provinces in the Philippines. We cover only five provinces. So that's one of the challenges in implementing the PHE program and be able to reach a lot of the youth, which comprise about 12% of the population. Just to pull you back and give you some basic facts about the Philippines, um, because I see some Filipinos out here and some friends. <laughs> um, the, there are 7,100 islands, and I always say it's either, depends if it's high tide or low tide. <laughs> 94 million people uh, were considered the 12th most populous country in the world. Um, if you notice, that's 2012. So 2013 now, maybe another million um, out there. Rapid population population growth, 1.9% when we were starting the project. Um, and this, I would like to think that we have somehow contributed. It's 2.3% uh, population growth rate. There's a very high population momentum, which is very important um, in this program, 35%. These are the number of, um, is the population that's below 15 years old which is actually going to drive the population growth rate in, in the years to come. There's an increasing poverty incidence despite government initiatives. Um, the latest survey shows that there's still 45% that live below $2. And this is in family for a family of five. With an archipelagic country, a majority of Filipinos reside in coastal zone. Um, I, um, Manila, where we live, and most of the areas that we work in are, are very much coastal and also fishing dependent. 
let me show you, go back to the uh, youth population dynamics. Uh, as I've mentioned, look at, if you look at the pyramid, um, population pyramid, we have a very youthful uh, population. Uh, there's a population bulge, which can be different all across the different uh, island groups in the Philippines. In the southernmost part, where there's a lot of migration from the other countries, it really goes, it's, it's way high uh, than the other uh, parts of, of the Philippines. Adolescents, 10 to 19 years old, that's, um, uh, we're looking at this as more of the definition that we put in, in the RH bill, make up 22% of the uh, overall population. There's a high fertility and teenage pregnancy, and we su see this as an issue um, that's kind of like universal as I listen to, to Leslie's presentation as well. But when we go to the more remote areas, island villages in the country, you'd see that the high fertility and there's a teenage pregnancy, both in school and out of school youth is, um, is common. Um, this reflects the, the need for family planning services because um, the access to family planning um, services, pills and condoms, is uh, highly unlikely in, in these island villages. 10% of 15 to 19 years old women uh, have begun childbearing. From this project, uh, some of the issues of the young people that we have encountered is that there is a high school dropout. And essentially, one of the reasons um, is the high poverty rate. And a significant proportion, they drop out of school because they're pregnant or they start to have babies to take care of. In the same way, because um, despite the fact that the education uh, among Filipinos is pretty high. Um, we have above 90% literacy rate. Um, as everyone is getting more education, um, there is a struggle with employment. So there's unemployment, particularly with the youth that have um, not finished secondary school and don't have any skills to be able to, to get them um, the ability to uh, for their own livelihood. There is a lack of access to family planning, reproductive health information and services. And this can be attributed to the fact that most of the health centers, um, and there are health centers in, in, in the country, um, it differs again from one um, town or municipality, uh, but there are health centers that's covered by one midwife. One would have one midwife, the ratio would be about three to five villages. So if you can imagine you cover um, island villages, then you get to see only your midwife probably once a month. So this all contributes to the lack of access, the lack of information, not only family planning, but the other basic health services in the country. The Youth Empower Project um, targets young people, 15 to 24 years old, to plan and implement integrated PHE approaches that promote self-help, improve quality of life, and enhance the sustainability of coastal and marine resources in high biodiversity areas. This is the current project, but there has been some initiatives of PATH Foundation previously um, doing PHE work with the youth, uh, highlighted, uh, highlighting the community outreach and peer education programs. This project specifically has uh, um, a stronger and a strong emphasis by providing skills and training and linking this youth uh, to livelihood programs, which was found to be a very strong um, uh, need. Uh, expressed by the youth and their parents as we were starting to do this work. We had a one year of doing um, pilot work, doing livelihood components with the youth. And I would like to start by saying, um, as I introduced the Empower Project, that we tried to work with uh, credit organizations and organizations that, have, that can provide seed grants and lending programs to the youth. And 
we found out with whether small or big, national or, or local lending and skills building for this, that youth has always been a part of their program, but no one has stepped in to really risk and put a little bit of funds for the youth to have access and train them on livelihood programs. So it was, uh, it was uh, somehow a good experience for us to be able to do some profiling, what kind of livelihood interventions would they like as an, as an um, conservation incentive for the conservation work that they do and to be in being able to be part of um, disseminating information on family planning, conservation, and uh, PhD links. So the goal of the project is, was to empower or is to empower the youth to take responsibility of their future by conserving natural resources and by acting responsibly in terms of their sexual and reproductive health behaviors. Um, this was a goal that we work with uh, and through the youth uh, were, were in our project sites and the objectives um, that we work with to achieve the goals was to increase youth awareness on the dynamics of PHE, including family planning and conservation, increase awareness and support among local governments for youth-focused PHE approaches that empower young people with the know-how to contribute to sustainable development effort. This is more of the involving the youth in local governance. Develop and identify youth-friendly PHE models. So. We've noticed in the Philippines that there are child-friendly programs, um, uh, um, friendly programs for the senior citizens, but that percentage of the youth that's, um, that's a huge human resource uh, don't have youth-friendly models. Uh, they can't even go to health centers to get family planning commodities. So this is part of the plan um, objectives that we wanted to establish and try in the Philippines. The fourth one is to improve youth economic efficiencies through environmentally friendly livelihood enterprises and skills that are appropriate and appealing to the youth. So this was another challenge for us because sometimes the parents would tell them this should be the livelihood that you would be involved in when they are into other things. Some of the components of the project um, as related their objectives are youth mobilization. So you'd see youth um, planting trees, uh, involved in local initiatives, uh, working with the local chiefs uh, to plant trees and clean watershed areas. You'd see them involved in uh, coastal cleanup, beach cleanup, and we also train youth peer educators using the same module uh, that Balance is using the balanced youth peer education model to be able to educate their peers. So in one, what we've learned in implementing this in the first site because of the huge population was that what would be a good ratio that you'd use to have a peer education? What we found out in, in our previous projects is that if you train even one youth peer educator in one sub-village, for example, you'd lose, m the, the likelihood that you'd lose the interest of the youth is bigger than when you train them in pairs. So there is, the lesson that we've learned is that they, they work well and better if they're together. They have someone to work with. So in the succeeding programs and in this Empower project, we, we cover, the, the idea is to cover as many villages, but conscious of the fact that for you to be able to have effective and, and functional youth peer educators, that they don't see it as work, but they see it as a fun thing to do with their peers, is to, the more that they are, uh, at least two or three in a group, then you see um, um, a niche for them to be able to do that. And I was trying to ask my, my, the, my kids and my nieces, how do you call it? Because in the Philippines, we call it barcada system. Uh, you have a click. And they said, oh, call it a click. But you know, click is usually associated with frats. So I said, no, but this inner program, you have a click. You, have, you develop them to be able to function as PhD educators. So two, at least two would, would work. 
So this is how we mobilize the youth. Youth participation in local governments. What, when we started with the program, the first initiative that we did was to train and identify youth peer educators in partnership with, um, with the organizations that are also involved in youth. So we have a federation, uh, it's a government uh, mandated federation of the youth that uh, looks into uh, the welfare of the youth. And that was one of the first steps that we went to. So there are church and there are government federated mandated organizations that we work with. And so we work with them to identify uh, potential youth peer leaders. So that was how we did it. So we were able, at least in one municipality, train at least 10 to 12 youth peer educators. It's not much, but we cover only um, not a lot of, of villages as well. And we brought them all from various areas. Their initiative, or the first initiative that they had was only training, but we worked with the local government to appoint someone who would be the leader of the youth from the local government. So either it was a nurse, it was, it was from the Ministry of, of Social Welfare, or from the Ministry of Environment. We put them all together in a room and develop a plan that they will go back to their own and respective local governments and present their program. So that was the first step for us, that it's a plan that's owned by the youth, it's prepared by the youth, and there we build their capacity to be able to present it with their local governments um, for them to accept and sustain it hopefully in the future. So um, you see in these pictures that these were things that they started working. Never thought, they never did this previously. And they were happy to look at how do we reach the other youth. Uh, they plan on how do we advocate to, to our to our um, local health officials and local governments that are elected so that they are going to be part of the discussion for, um, for, for community initiatives that involves youth participation. And from our experience, that worked very well for us because they already have a champion within, within the local governments that made appointments for them and they were able to um, help improve their plans and be able to make it acceptable for uh, the legislative uh, commission committee within the local governments. And that's the other component, the environmentally friendly enterprises. What we did initially was we came up with profiles. What, what would be your interest in terms of the livelihood components that you want to do? And I was the first, the first initiatives, I see them uh, coming up with um, <coughs> chicken racing or pig racing. I said, this is, to me I said, Seems like a very old initiative. These are the things that your parents would do, and these are the things that we would we would have heard previously. And with more um, in-depth discussions, they wanted reflexologies. They wanted to be involved in massage um, therapy. They wanted to put up their own um, uh, areas, working with the local governments to uh, to be to be trained on on. Uh, also on cooking, bakery, bake shop, and one of them put up a grill uh, in one of the municipalities. So they became caterers for all the trainings that were conducted. So we link all of this up, and one um, youth group per municipality would have different uh, uh, interests. Um, so these are the various things that they have done on uh, enterprises, uh, enterprise development. The challenges that, that we have encountered with this is that they needed to be um, taught and build capacity in terms of managing their funds. So when they came up with this, they have their plan said, oh, this will be my, the revenue that we'll have. And if we came up with this revenue, 10% would go to uh, IEC component. You know. So that was good, but monitoring them and making them or providing them with management in financial systems was one big lesson for us that should come whenever we have environmentally friendly enterprise programs. 
a key result areas. We've trained uh, close to 300 now uh, to serve as volunteer youth peer educators in the two key biodiversity areas. There's enhanced capacity of the youth in developing site-specific work plans, promoting youth understanding and participation in local governance. So to date, uh, there's close to 80 uh, youth who are trained on environmentally friendly enterprise development. So uh, we linked up with a lot of institutions, with the national governments, because we were looking at employability of the youth. So for example, there's a national technical assistance program um, in, 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 the, in the Philippines, wherein if they are trained by, by them and they take a national certification test, they can actually use this um, to gain um, employment in country and outside of the country. Best practices and lessons learned, I think I've mentioned a few as I was going through, but uh, just to sum it up, encouraging youth to become stewards of their sexu sexuality and their environment is an alternative approach to abstinence promotion that appeals to youth in coastal communities. It's a reality, uh, there's a lot of reality in terms of teenage pregnancy, um, there's actually issues on having fraternities and drugs, and these are some of the things that we were able to institute within these communities that help them uh, see their value as a youth now and in the future. Peer education approach affects desired changes in youth attitudes and practices regarding premarital second steward and stewardship of their sexu sexuality and coastal environment. This is one of the most important um, that we've learned in this project, engage parents of YPEs in the project effort. The support of parents is key to securing youth involvement and sustaining YPE volunteerism. Youth gain confidence in their ability to become a leader and agents of change because of the goodwill and affirmation of the parents. We had a lot of discussion about uh, them being able to provide pills and condoms as a youth group. Um, and we negotiated with them and said, they said, this is the son of my parents. We are a youth group, you know. So we, we have to strike a common uh, thing that you don't, they don't openly say they are uh, community-based distributors of pills and commodities, but when us and they do counseling, they provide. So I think because that it's very targeted, um, it's, it's appropriate in terms of the services and the, um, and the information that we provide, we were able to get the support of their parents. Uh, and in fact, their parents, even if we do trainings for three days or four days. They're very willing to lend us their, their, their kids to be with us. In conclusion, um, exposing youth, young people to information about PhD and food security dynamics can be a powerful tool to steer their interest and commitment to care for the environment and become sexually responsible individuals providing livelihood skills training and opportunities to initiate environmentally friendly enterprises uh, help reinforce their commitment to conservation while enabling the youth to become economically productive members of the society. Um, so that ends my presentation. We want happier, healthier youth. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Joanne. I think some, some really interesting components in, in your program. I, I was quite intrigued to see in your goal the focus on responsibility and sort of getting the youth to appreciate and assume that responsibility. Very interesting connections to livelihood, opportunities, what that meant in terms of uh, environmentally friendly enterprises, local governance, uh, access to credit, uh, so some very, very interesting dimensions. And then some interesting lessons about youth-friendly models, training them in pairs, um, very much in keeping with the, the Pinoy tradition of making sure that whatever is proposed is, is effective and fashionable, a very a strong component of reaching out to, to, to youth and engaging them and their parents and also champions um, within the local governance structures who will create opportunities and space 
for them. So, so thank you. We'd like to, to open it up now. Um, hope that you have some good uh, questions and comments. Um, we are recording this event, so we would ask um, that you wait for one of my colleagues to come to you with a microphone and ask that you introduce yourself, give your name and your affiliation, and uh, let's open it up for some questions. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, thank, thank you both very much for your presentation. Um, this question is mostly for Joan, but also Sorry if I can ask you a name and affiliation. Oh, sorry. Um, my name is Rocky Cassad. I work for the EPA. Um, I, this question is mostly for Joan, but also for Leslie. Could you talk a little bit about, um, for Joan, if there were any barriers for girls and women to participate in some of the programs and activities? And then, Leslie, if you could talk a little bit for the nurses program, what was a gender composition, men versus women? That would just be interesting to know. Thank you again. Thank you for the question. Interestingly, we had equal, uh, there was a conscious effort for us to have both uh, um, both females and males as peer educators. And for reasons that we are aware that it, for that they'd have different issues and, and in terms of being able to have more in-depth discussions on sexuality. Um, so in terms of barriers, there is not that much that really um, jumped out in terms of the program because of the conscious effort. So I think that helps as well, being able to do that. Um, in the Philippines, you'll notice that there are more we girls than boys in school. So um, what we did with the program is that if they were in school, some of them or more of them would be in school girls. But then from the out school, then we would get the boys. Mm. Uh, I think the dynamics would be more if it's in school or out school uh, in terms of implementing the program. Um, there's always the different dynamics, you know, the macho boys type and, and the rapper type. What, uh, what are you talking about? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it's interesting that when you put them together, they click. I think it's like they're they're in the water right away. Uh, they have a common goal, common issue. No matter if you're from from actually in school, out school, male or female, um, even the leadership we've noticed that uh, they take on. Um. Uh, so the gender composition in the nurses training school, there is definitely a higher percentage of female student nurses. So out of the 600 student nurses that are attending the school, about only 50 students are males. And then in our student association for PHE, we have about eight males involved and the rest female. So Joanne, just to, to follow up a little bit, um, with, in terms of parental um, willingness to participate. You, you said that they were very much willing to lend you their kids. Were, were um, parents as equally willing for the girl children and the boy children? And Leslie, to what degree were you bringing in parents also? That's actually interesting because the entry point was the livelihood for mm. the parents to be involved. Because, and we've started with the youth grill program. So the the the, the grill program usually in this municipality happens after dark. So they turn the garage, a community garage for all the buses and the trucks. Uh, it, turns, uh, it, it, it turns to be a, s a market and a restaurant, an open restaurant at night. And the local government that we work with allowed this youth, the PHE youth group, to be able to establish their own area. So they would work from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. So that was the start of the in engaging the youth. So, um, and of course, the parents would say, you have a curfew or something. But with this, with this pro program, they were able, they were even there to help them prepare the food. So, um, and we'd have, I'd like to say that we also involved the gay and lesbian groups in this, in, this, uh, in this youth peer education program. So we have equally boys and girls and, 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 and everyone in there. Um, so I think in terms of um, if it's the boys or the girls, because as I've mentioned, we have more or less equal. We had equal uh, um, opportunities to deal with their parents who allowed both. 
and because they have formed their own group, they take care of each other. So usually in the YPE, I think one of the things that's striking when we say the youth will be a sustainability component, yes, but we need to, 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 to train the incoming because we have an age group in terms of they will be graduating. You'll never be a youth peer educator forever. You'll graduate to become an adult peer educator. So the second generation of leadership has to continue with the program. And, and the same way you talk to the parents. So if you're able to do good with this generation of youth and their parents, they encourage you uh, to do more in the next generation of leaders of youth. Uh, for our parent involvement for the nurses training school, these are uh, adults primarily, and so there's not a lot of parent involvement on, on their side. However, when we go into the communities and we are speaking to community members, a lot of times we are speaking to the parents of the adolescents, and they are really happy to hear the messages of, of the PHE especially related to adolescent reproductive health, and they definitely see the need for um, their adolescents to use family planning methods and to reduce that teenage pregnancy rate. Yes, please. Hi, my name is Patrick Realisa, and I'm with the U.S. Department of Treasury. Um, this question is for do uh, Dr. Castro. Um, I know you mentioned in the um, beginning or um, in your presentation regarding the participation of um, other organizations or associations. So my question is, for example, um, the Asian Development Bank, which is based in Mandaluyong in Manila. Um, what kinds of things are you guys been doing with them in cooperation to promote um, your initiative and so forth? And also, um, capitalizing on the large Filipino diaspora. Um, are you, or have you, do you have any plans in uh, engaging uh, youth um, across the globe from the, from the Philippines to come to the Philippines and assist with these programs? So it sounds like you're signing up. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> Thank you, Patrick, for the question. Uh, frankly, at this point, none with ADB, but we have limited, um, ourselves with working, building up this program within the communities that we work in. Um, we've worked with ADB and youth, but not on PHE. So I think it's, it's, um, it's something that we would like to tap into, uh, uh, looking at other areas, because um, easily there's still a lot of work to do, uh, but we are confident that we have enough lessons learned and models that we can present to them. Um, and not only ADB, uh, we would like to look at other, other agencies as well in development that would be interested to look at the youth. Um, it's interesting also that you mentioned about the diaspora, um, not specifically uh, signing up, but it's a good idea. Uh, what we did was we actually uh, shared our manuals to a school of nurses that's based in California. And it's a nursing group that promotes voluntarism um, in terms of giving back to their own municipalities. So we hosted, in fact, um, uh, last December, a group of nurses that uh, we provided samples of the IEC materials. And what we're getting right now is that uh, in return, um, they give a little bit of amount, and we are able to showcase, more importantly, the products that we have so that if they're interested to buy into it, print some IEC materials for the youth, if that was their interest, then we are able to do that. So in small ways, uh, we do uh, be interested to to talk to you if you have uh, other ideas to do that, or if you can link us up. It's it's, uh, I think the opportunities are, are there. Um, maybe I'm, we need to look more. Well, uh, my name is uh, Luigi Jaramillo with uh, University Research uh, Company. Uh, my question to both of you um, is related to the uh, enable environment for family planning, both in Ghana and the Philippines. And if you guys are doing something to tackle that huge problem that for quite some time, almost uh, half a century, it's been uh, limiting the access uh, to uh, adolescents to family planning services.
Small question. I know. <laughs> uh, so your, your question was what we're doing to uh, promote access to family planning for adolescents, if I understand correctly. So how are you engaging the national government and any government agencies to help create an environment that is more receptive to increasing access mm -hmm. um, to services for youth? Well, it's, uh, it's not only a, a challenge for youth, but also for all um, females in this area of Ghana. Uh, but the Ghana Health Service is trying to implement a community-based distribution system that will bring those uh, family planning commodities to the individuals in the villages. And part of that program will hopefully train the uh, community-based distributors in reaching out to adolescents specifically as well and in how to um, help communities accept the adolescent use of family planning commodities. In the Philippines, um, PFPI in particular has a very strong component on policy advocacy, both at the local government um, or more at the local government. We have had some initiatives at the national level, um, but I believe, I would like to believe that the RH bill will push a lot of, of this enabling environment, uh, which has a particular Im component of being able to provide um, and put funds um, that can be provided all across and sustained all across the local governments. Um, Path Foundation per se works with the local governments to involve the youth. We work with local governments to train the private sector uh, for access because knowing the fact that they don't go to the health centers, they go to pharmacies, that's one initiative that we have implemented in this in this component, uh, and the, these pharmacies, as private businesses, don't really report to the local governments. But we forge that kind of public-private partnership with the local governments. What we try to do, and I think it's very Filipino, is what we call cook down and you cook up. So bottoms up and uh, top down and bottoms up. We we show results at the local le level. We have a PHA ordinance that provides equal access to both adolescents and adults. Um, not, not in a huge, huge way because it's really very local. Uh, but I think these are small successes. But um, we never relent in doing advocacy both at the local and um, the national level. Joanne, may I ask you to just to say a couple words about the reproductive health law, if, if in case anyone's not aware of it? So the National uh, Re Reproductive Health Law has been, um, it's a struggle in the country for the past two decades. So it's, a, it's going to reach its uh, debut. Uh, it will have, it will be 18 years. But it was finally passed uh, and signed into law by the president, by President Aquino um, during Christmas, a very, very laid back activity. And there were no, no fancy, no, no big, uh, big information. And uh, where is it right now? The, the implementation rules and regulations have been prepared already. It was signed uh, the month of the Women's Month. Uh, it's, it was finished during the Women's Month, but currently there are uh, cases that are pending with uh, at the, the, the Supreme Court uh, from the um, anti-RH groups and organizations. So there it's, it's called, uh, it's on a status quo at this moment. And so there's going to be discussions uh, at the Supreme Court until, so there's 120 days uh, uh, window of opportunity to be able to discuss again all the same issues that have been discussed before. So that's where we are. Um, I think despite that, it's a huge landmark and huge success for, for us. Yes, we have three hands.
Hi, uh, my name is Hannah Marcusy from USAID. Um, this is for Leslie. I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you got involved with the Balance Project to begin with um, and what kind of support you got from Peace Corps and also um, what's going to happen after you leave, if there'll be any future Peace Corps volunteers involved with the project. Thanks. So the involvement with Balanced came from my partnership with the Coastal Resources Center. Uh, Balanced is a component of the Coastal Resources Center, and so when I was assigned to work with the PHE project, then that just naturally occurred with Balanced. Uh, Peace Corps, um, there hasn't been a lot of involvement with Peace Corps. Uh, this is just my Peace Corps assignment. and. So uh, unfortunately, there will not be a replacement volunteer coming in three months, um, which is really a shame. But I hope that the uh, staff at the school will really continue the, the program that has been started. Hi, this is Linda Bruce. I'm the director of the Balance Project. We, our name's been mentioned in vain a couple times today. So I just wanted to build on what Leslie's saying. Two things. Uh, first of all, I take my head off to Leslie because this is not necessarily a balanced activity, so I want to make that very clear. We provided them technical assistance. She ran with it. Everything that you saw here, she, she ran with it. The Coastal Resources Center, which is the prime organization that runs Balance Project, also runs the Hinopuano project. And so that was mostly a coastal resource management and governance project. The chief of party happened to be also really into PHE, and CRC was also doing the balance project, which is a PHE project. It's a natural fit. But the activity we did in Ghana was not a balanced activity. We, we gave them technical assistance. Now, I think this is important because it means it doesn't have to be funded by a PHG project, that it can actually be incorporated in any kind of conservation project. The other thing is about the Peace Corps volunteer, I don't know the dynamics, but the Hinopono project is ending very soon, and there, there may be a re rebid. I don't know anything about procurement. But so that might be one of the reasons why there's no follow-on, because there's no, for a Peace Corps volunteer in the area. Because there's, there's uncertainty about what will happen with Hinopuano. Okay, thank you, Linda. So we have Etiana and Janet. <coughs> Hi, uh, Etiana Scazzaro with Population Action International. I actually, I just returned from Bangladesh where I learned that in their case, there's stormwater surge as a cause of climate change in their coastal regions, which is causing increased salinity in the in the coastal area and, and that interestingly that impacts um, preeclampsia and hypertension in pregnant women and I was wondering if that if you've heard of that in the coastal zones you work in or if that's something that's unique to Bangladesh it's something I've just learned about and was interested if if you were aware of it yourselves thanks I haven't heard of that <laughs> sorry there's one study in Bangladesh that <laughs> all of the groups are working on this in Bangladesh talk about but it would be interesting to find out if, if what are the conditions that behind that study in Bangladesh and whether that has been examined elsewhere. Good, good question. Janet? Uh, so I'm Janet Edmund. I work for Conservation International, and we're a partner on the Balance Project with Joanne and Linda. Um, and actually, I want to go back to Hannah's question about Peace Corps. Mm -hmm. I've actually noticed it's not just in Ghana. There have been other mentions of Peace Corps volunteers who've helped out with PHE projects. So I'm just wondering if you two maybe can um, maybe give some recommendations or thoughts about maybe how Peace Corps could be more engaged, you know, if they'd ever have a PHE track for volunteers as opposed to MCH or environment or something like that. And then um, I may have missed it at the beginning. I'm sorry I came in late. but um, did you guys talk about social media at all and how you're using that to engage the youth? I think I missed that, so. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so the Peace Corps has recently been uh, partnering their volunteers with other organizations so that they're not just on their own in a community. And so I think that's something that's a little new, and they're, they're still working out some kinks and things like that. But um, 
I wish that PHE was one of the sectors within Peace Corps. Uh, I think that the link between the health sector and the environment sector could really benefit not only coastal zones, but of course, uh, all over uh, the country, these countries. Um, in, in Ghana, there are so many areas that there is no environmental management, natural resource management, and so there, there's a good opportunity for PHE throughout Ghana, and so it would, it would be a good sector to have in Peace Corps. In the Philippines, we actually, and thank you for reminding, the Peace Corps have been working with us, or we were working with Peace Corps, so both in the project side. So we have Peace Corps who are involved and particularly particularly interested with the youth component, both in the Verde Island Passage and um, in the Danahon Back, where these are the two marine key biodiversity areas we were in. So we have at least three Peace Corps who help facilitate trainings, uh, were part of the planning uh, activities that we've had. And I think um, before I left, there was an indication of one of the Peace Corps to want to put it forward to the Peace Corps uh, during the Peace Corps meeting. Uh, so I hope that's a positive aspect um, also in terms of getting this mainstream into the Peace Corps programs. Um, in, in Senegal, we had a Peace Corps leader who was part of the training, who was very interested in, in PHE and was part of the PHE design workshop, developed one himself. But probably it's worth looking and monitoring what happened with that. Um, on the social media, yes, it's been this, the Facebook was, was one of the biggest uh, link of all of these youth, that no matter where they are, uh, they were able to update each other and provided information. So yes, it's, it's actually being used. It's one of the things that they've identified they like to use. And uh, social media? Yes. Yeah, any? any? I think that's a great idea, and I think I'm going to bring that back to Ghana. Yeah. <laughs> great. Any, any more questions? No? Yes. Sandeep? Uh, I just had a question across the board. I know we're talking about how to... Um, I'm sorry, can you introduce yourself? Oh, sorry, yes. <laughs> As I usually am the one to remind people <laughs> to introduce themselves. I, I'm Cindy Patala. I'm with the Environmental Change and Security Program here at the Wilson Center. Um, so I'm thinking about some of the opportunities I've had to, to see programs on the PG programs on the ground, and I feel like um, youth has been identified as a, as a real good avenue to, um, for spreading messages, to, to do action on the ground for the environment. And I'm just wondering, you know, how often um, projects get to interface with each other um, and talk about the different uh, initiatives being done with youth and where you might have opportunities to um, share lessons learned amongst yourselves. Uh, well, within the Peace Corps, there are several um, different groups or organizations that volunteers sort of organize themselves. One of them is the gender and youth development uh, group. And so we have met briefly and talked about how that my PHE work could possibly uh, translate into some of the gender and youth development work that the other volunteers are doing. So there has been some uh, communication between those those different projects, but um, I, I stop there. I actually sorry. meant amongst uh, about amongst you guys. I mean, oh, there are sorry. Projects happening across the world for interinstitutional. Well, yes, uh, definitely between Joanne and I, and she has actually come to Ghana and provided some technical assistance, and so for us in Ghana, we've really benefited from her experience and assistance. The, the Balance Project provided a huge opportunity for exchange across the countries that we work in. Um, so that was uh, that's a big opportunity. Within country, um, there's, uh, there's also a conscious effort to do that. But I think for, for what 
what the why we didn't do it more aggressively is that because we're str still trying to build up uh, these activities. So what we're doing right now, not across projects, but for example, tapping into the, the mandated uh, youth programs of the government, it's really like linking and networking with existing government programs and church activities. So that's how far that we did with, with the initiatives uh, all acro across the youth programs in country. Going once. Yes, I knew I would get someone. <laughs> I think this is Luigi Jaramillo from University Research again. I, I just have a question, um, and, and perhaps um, the work is still very recent, but I'm just wondering how are you thinking about measuring the impact of all the good work that is being done? And, and, and eventually how to present those results that it will leverage more resources to the cost. How do you measure impact and use that to generate further support? Um, I was wanting to share, <laughs> but I, I didn't get the report. There's a baseline behavior monitoring survey that we did related to this, and it's the same reason uh, that we wanted to measure results. It, my concern is that the project is not very long, so we might be able only to measure some um, process um, indicators and results along the way. But nevertheless, we were able to, uh, even with a balanced project, we had a behavior monitoring surveys that looks at, uh, that also includes the same youth groups, so 15 to uh, so the reproductive hill, hill age group. But I think we may need to look into it more to uh, look at the age disaggregation to be able to get to these results. Um, so yes, uh, we have initiatives, um, uh, and, and we hope to be able to do some follow-on or at least look at the trends in terms of achieving impacts. Uh, from from our project in Ghana, we have been measuring the number of people reached with the PHE messages, and then uh, once the Ghana Health Service gets uh, a CVD program going, then we can also measure the number of new family planning users. Uh, there was no baseline assessment uh, conducted, unfortunately. That would have been really helpful to, to measure some, some of those impacts. I wish that that had been done. Great, well thank you. I think one of the interesting things to see is sort of the changing perspectives and, and actual behavior coming out of it and sort of engaging the parents and adults and, and champions who will um, also serve to further some of the goals of these youth-focused projects, but also recognizing, as, as you both mentioned, as these youth themselves age, that they themselves will become parents and, and, and champions. So um, you're on a good path. So congratulations and, and thank you very much for the, the excellent presentations. So I would like to invite you moving forward to visit our website, wilsoncenter.org, and our blog, newsecuritybeat.org, and also to follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Um, we will be writing up some of the discussion that we've had today, and we'll be posting some information uh, about youth initiatives moving forward. We, we at the center have recognized that this is not something that we've very often had events on, and there's a lot of interest and very interesting perspectives, I think, coming out of a very rich and informative discussion such as we had today. So let's, let's put our hands together to congratulate and thank you. I encourage you to hang around for a few minutes and chat and network some more. So thank you very much.